Hello, and welcome to Japanese Acupuncture Today, the Hangouts on Air show that brings together experts from the many different styles of Japanese acupuncture. In the coming weeks, we'll be covering a broad range of topics for Japanese acupuncture professionals, teachers, and students, and also anyone else who's interested in learning more about our various approaches to healing. Today's show is about scarring and the importance of treating scars in our daily clinical practice. My first exposure to scarring and to treating scars with acupuncture dates back to my student days under Dr. Van Buren in the UK. I first saw him insert two needles into either end of a caesarean scar. The insertion was shallow, something I'd never seen before, only about one millimeter, and I was amazed to see a color change in the scar within a few minutes. The following week, it looked less purple and swollen. Since those early days, the acupuncture treatment of scars has become ever more sophisticated. And today, I've invited four practitioners of Japanese acupuncture who all treat scars in their own unique ways. So I'm going to introduce my panel. The first of my guests is Paul Mofsessian from Australia. Paul has been a pioneer of Japanese acupuncture in Australia. Together with Stephen Birch, Paul created a wave of high-quality Japanese acupuncture teaching including Manuka and Toyohari style. He helped to set up the Australian branch of the Toyohari Association, and even though he's a highly skilled practitioner, he's a modest bloke, and he still goes regularly to Japan to practice and improve his skills. Paul has developed his own method for treating scars and has taught extensively all over Australia. Hi, Paul. Good to see you. How's it Hello, Lauren. Hi. Uh, it's doing a bit better, thank you. Oh, Thanks for your great. invitation. Great. My next guest is Virginia Doran from the US. Virginia has been in holistic health for the longest time. She's also been practicing acupuncture since 1995, studying both with Jeffrey Yuan and many Japanese teachers, including Yuriko Yamagishi, Mikishima, Koei Kuwahara, Kiko Matsumoto, and one of my own teachers, the late Yanagishita Sensei. Virginia has developed and taught her own method of facial rejuvenation acupuncture, teaching all over the world, including Europe, the US, and even Japan. She's currently writing two books on facial rejuvenation acupuncture, one for professionals, with a dedicated section on the treatment of scars, and one for the public. Hi, Virginia. I'm really looking forward oh, to hi, hearing your on everything today. What, what time is it over there? It's uh, about 8 p.m. Sunday night. Oh, OK. My next panelist is Phil Strong from Australia. So back in 1980, as a senior instructor in the Australian Taekwondo Association, Phil started to uh, get into acupuncture. And more formal studies began in 1996. He is specialized in the treatment of scarring through the three, using the third of the nine classical needles, known as a teishin or blunt needle, and has studied the effects of superficial scars and deeper tissue injuries, including adhesions. Subsequently, he's lectured on his scar rejuvenation technique and has been published in Najon, the bilingual English-Japanese acupuncture journal. Phil, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Good morning, Warren. How are you? I'm great, thank you. So, my last guest is Grace Rollins, also from the US. Grace is based near Philadelphia and specializes in Kiko Matsumoto's style of acupuncture. As I think our viewers will know, Kiko is a world-famous pioneer in the West, not only of Japanese acupuncture, but of scar treatment. Grace is a close apprentice to Kiko and has 10 years of experience with her methods. So, welcome everybody, and welcome Grace. Thanks, Aaron. Um, through the wonders of the internet, we can now have our very own chat show. So it's great that you could all find the time to come on. Uh, so let's get cracking and start talking about scars. What are scars, energetically speaking? And why is there such an emphasis on treating scars in Japanese acupuncture? Paul, would you like to kick off? Sure, thank you, Aaron. Well, we can look at it from the perspective of, uh, oh, well, firstly, it's, it's important to think of the fact that in Western medicine, they don't really have a very good handle or understanding of scars themselves. Uh, so 
even from that perspective, they do, they don't know how how to manage scars, and they don't take much notice where they make a scar. But from Eastern perspective, we know that there are not only the primary problems that arise where a scar occurs, but also the secondary effects which occur later, many years later. And and why these occur is because the healing hasn't hasn't occurred, and adhesions have 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 existed under the tissue. And in simple terms, we can say we can see a scar as chi stagnation or blood stagnation, a blood stasis pattern. And the location of this scar and where and, and its formation will then determine its secondary effects in how it obstructs the flow of chi. Mm. Thank you. Has anyone got anything to add to that? Um, sure. Grace. Um. Well, I uh, one of the first things that I studied in trying to understand how to treat scars was a 1989 article by Kiko Matsumoto um, that began with her discussion of uh, her observations of how easily Toyohari teachers could influence the pulse by very superficial insertion of needles or sometimes non-insertion of needles, and that got her to thinking about how, you know, very shallowly uh, key traverses the body. And, uh, and so when she began her work of palpating abdomens as diagnosis, it struck her that, well, you know, what are these scars that I'm seeing on everyone's abdomen influencing? Because the abdomen is so important. And, the, you know, some of these scars would be pretty nasty looking, red or keloid or you know, deep adhesions, and, you know, it, she was convinced, well, treating these scars must be very important because they, they must be causing some disturbance in the flow of key in these people's bodies. Um, so, you know, from, a, from an Eastern medicine point of view, I, I think that's the, the best way of talking about scars is how are they disturbing the flow of key in the body. It's very simple. Um, and then, and from a physiological standpoint as well, we can easily talk about what distortions in the fascia do because people are starting to talk about acupuncture in that way, like acupuncture as influencing fascia in the body and connecting to organs and connecting throughout the body um, just through very subtle manipulation of the fascia. And so if there's a, a twist in the fascia, that's going to be, ca be causing ramifications throughout the body. Mm. Thank you. Virginia? Yes. What are you asking? Yeah, it's, uh, Virginia, it seemed, it seemed like you had something to say earlier on when I said, does anyone have anything to add to that? Is there anything you wanted to add to any of that? Or are, are you okay? So. Well, the uh, we're going to be primarily talking about treating scars physically, but there's traumas that get stored in the connective tissue and the, the fascia of the body. Uh, memories and traumas, this is what Rothing is based on. and it's not just deep massage, but also acupuncture can stimulate those traumas to be released from the body. And uh, I think it's very, very effective for that. And so we have to be mindful that somebody might have more than just a physical trauma associated with that scar. Okay, I've got another question for the panel now. Uh, what kind of scars need treating? I mean, are we going to treat every single scar that we find in the body or are we are there some uh, scars in particular uh, that need treating Phil can I pass that question to you yes I thank you Oren I believe that we can uh, look at the earlier scars that could perhaps have been created from and then subsequent stuff scars occur during life so these complicate things and add on to the whole disruption of key in the body. So uh, I think that the earlier scars should be looked at first because I found a relationship with uh, people with that appendectomies uh, tend to have a higher incidence of sciatic problems. So I try to uh, know which side the sciatic is, it's always uh, tends to relate back to the uh, appendectomy scar. 
In my own experience, I've noted that if a scar is raised or hot or discolored or when you when you palpate that you can feel some kind of uh, presence underneath the scar, then those are often the most uh, commonly um, the, the most common signs that a scar needs to be treated. Uh, does anyone have any other observations on the appearance of scars that need to be treated? Sure. Or is <laughs> yeah, you both started to go. Go ahead, Grace. Go ahead, Grace. Uh, well, for me, part of it has to do with what is the patient's chief complaint that they're coming in for, and can I uh, associate a scar with uh, possibly causing a disturbance that can be contributing to their complaint? Um, because you know, helping them with what they're asking me to help with is is a priority. So, uh, but there are sometimes uh, scars that we'll notice that have such an important effect on the patient's constitution that we'll treat those as well. So, if it seems to be um, creating a disturbance in a zong or foot organ, um, or it's on a major meridian like the the bladder meridian or the ren or the du, um, scars on the head a lot of the time. Will, will cause big disturbances or scars on the foot for that matter. Um, so, so yeah, some, sometimes we have to, to take in conti into consideration the, the location of the scar as well as the, the quality of it. Okay. And Thank scars you. are like a, an iceberg. The scars could be likened to an iceberg or Pandora's box. You don't know what you're going to find. And, uh, you know, sometimes a scar well, it's a, it's charged or active or toxic, however you want to describe it in language. So sometimes the uh, usually the ones that look red and inflamed are the ones that are the culprit. But sometimes there's old scars that you know are kind of sneaky and they have uh, kind of like a minefield underneath the surface that we don't see. Okay. So now I'm going to move the question uh, to each of you in turn and find out um, how do you go about treating scars and uh, w what is your approach? So uh, Virginia, would you like to kick off and tell us w w what's your approach to treating scars? Well, I think palpation is the first step. And looking at the scar and what meridians it might be uh, intersecting with um, and also you know, thinking constitutionally before you even get into any local treatment. For instance, if somebody's had a surgical scar for, say, an appendectomy, then you might have to treat some kind of spleen deficiency uh, concurrently or in addition to. So um, then I would probably uh, try to find a couple of tender spots uh, locally. Uh, maybe in the perimeters of the scar and you know probably through successive treatments or uh, depending how stubborn the scar was I might eventually needle into the scar itself. And do you needle into the scar tissue or do you needle just away from the scar on, on the borders? Well I think I might start in the perimeter but what I find sometimes with something like wrinkle is, wrinkles is if you do that kind of treatment um, just coming up to the borders uh, with wrinkles it's not enough to fill them up with collagen and that's part of what we're trying to do with the is alter the collagen in the scar tissue and the fibroblasts and all these things so um, I think for some scars it's necessary to actually needle into them but that's not necessarily something you have to start out doing Okay. But, you know, this is something Kiko does. I know there's other people who never needle directly into anything. Um, so, yeah. you know, there's there's definitely different styles, and I'm, you know, okay. uh, looking forward to hearing about other people's approaches as well. I'm going to pass the question to someone who I think doesn't needle into anything. Phil, um, <laughs> you're, using, you're using a Tatian for most of the time. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your uh, approach to actually treating the scar? Yes, um, I use the Yanagishta Gultation. It's got a, a very small photo there to demonstrate to you. About uh, three and a half inches long, and it's it's gold painted. I've used uh, solid gold tations as well. 
um, I've found that uh, these scars, whether they're surgical, accidental, or even burn scars from flame or water, uh, does eventually, over time, sometimes more immediate than others, uh, it does create a blockage through for that person's constitution. Now, I'm just showing you here a, uh, a crush injury from a forklift. So you can see a number of toes. Oh, we're not the, seeing the image. Oh, I see. Um, OK, I won't bother. OK. Um, I don't use predominantly the classic, always going to the militancy end of the station, uh, needing to be uh, rubbing the marine. Uh, I found that using the sharper end of the tension can get a stronger movement of heat through the tension and into the, where the area of the scar tissue is. And as we've been saying earlier, there's scars that uh, are discoloured and lumpy, but we also have uh, areas of sogginess and depression there. Um, so particularly my focus for all my research started with the caesarean scar. And we know that with any caesarean that uh, runs uh, horizontally across the abdomen, there's at least five meridians affected. Thanks. Paul, can I ask you to talk about your approach to scars? Sure. I, th I think uh, there's some aspects that are worth uh, looking, looking at for this. The first is to consider that in the Japanese system in general, even though we're treating something local like a scar, we still have to consider the constitution. So there's always a constitutional treatment that accompanies the scar treatment. The second is to evaluate the scar. And we can use a concept from the blood stasis model, which is a pathological vascular spider versus a, uh, a, a uh, physiological vascular spider. We can see that sometimes with scars. Sometimes scars are just are healthy, are fine. And I, I like to differentiate between the scar and the scar tissue itself because the, often the scar may have the problem but then underneath as um, Virginia was saying that's where we might find all the problem resides and then consequently the secondary effects. So to treat that we'll, we'll often use from Dr. Menaka's work ideas that he first discovered with treating burns, which was some kind of polarity device to move and change the positive and negative ions on the tissue that then connect to the deeper channel systems, often the extraordinary ves vessel uh, systems. So we may use, um, I can put up a, a, a demonstration for you here, like of um, iron pumping cord. Uh, can you, uh, how do you see that? And um, and so that's an iron pumping cord, which is a polarity device. And uh, so with that, we'll often uh, attach something to the site where the inflammation is. It could be foil, a silver chain, a silver ring, a diode ring, uh, and often attach the black clip for inflammatory conditions or pain or the red clip in numbness, and then use a distal point to try to move that. But he also had many other polarity devices like uh, electrostatic absorbers, ion beam devices. Uh, all of these uh, were very effective. Uh, this is a, an example of an electrostatic absorber which tends to take out the charge from the tissue, whereas uh, the um, ion beam device tends to be able to put in uh, a charge so you can get that effect much more quickly occurring. Sometimes I might uh, use a, uh, a press tack and then put the ion beam device over the press tack, putting the charge in at a deeper level to the tissue. So these are some of the ways that we'll, we'll work with them. But ultimately, after that's finished, I, I have always found that I still have to go to the scar and find the last residuals, uh, pressure pain. And with that, I often use direct moxa or a uh, some kind of heating uh, pressing device. It could be a thermi warmer or an elephant warmer or some kind of moxa heat and pressure. Grace, can you tell us a little bit about your approach? 
Sure. Um, my approach is based very much on uh, what Kiko Matsumoto demonstrates. Um, and a hallmark of her style of acupuncture is to use distal points to release uh, symptomatic areas that she finds by way of palpation. Uh, so in clinic, what I do when an, a patient has a scar that I think needs treating it, uh, is to first palpate that scar for tenderness um, or, you know, if there's a lot of hardness around the area, feeling of, of coagulation, and then see if there's a related point or a set of points that might help to release the pain in that scar. And then that'll show me that the key is moving better and that that area is going to start to heal because I've made a good selection. And then when needling the distal points, I want to make sure that the needle was inserted properly in the right direction, uh, the right depth to continue that positive influence. Um, in terms of treating scars directly or locally, uh, if if a scar is extremely inflamed, the only way that I, I usually will treat a scar directly is with um, the uh, the Manaka methods that, that I know by way of Kiko using um, ion pumping cords uh, similar to, to what um, Paul spoke of. And um, I'll use that, the diode rings, chain, um, Pachi Pachi Sparker, or magnets. Could you say or, a little bit about yeah. um, what, what a silver chain is? For those of us who don't know Kiko Matsumoto's kind of equipment, uh, what, what is the silver chain and how does it work? Well, I, I would hand that over to Paul because I believe it's originally by way of Manaka, isn't it? Uh, it is, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, Paul, why don't you talk about it? Because I think you're more of an expert <laughs> on Manaka. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, what he did was originally when he designed his whole program before he came up with ion pumping cords he used a silver chain to connect the sterilized tin foil from a burn to a site where he was distally trying to ch move the ions and uh, with time that got transferred to this copper wiring system that we now have later that chain started to be picked up by um, Dr. Kawai an associate of Dr. Manaka who was part of the topology association and uh, but Dr. Manaka also used to use the chains to, uh, in in terms of uh, wrapping around an area, you could uh, encompass an area right around, and then Dr. Kawai further in, in interacted with that and put little diodes spaced within the chain. So the mm -hmm. chain was it was an actual polarity device on its own without even being attached to cords. So it was very clever. I mean that whole movement was so innovative. Uh, the minus plus school and the topology association they were they were amazing at, at their time of um, functioning they don't exist now as an, as an as a group anymore unfortunately so what would you all recommend for uh, viewers of our show uh, practitioners should they all be going out and buying this equipment or should they all be studying how to treat scars studying how to treat scars first so they would know how to use it if they were going to but there are certainly ways to treat it without all these devices. Yeah. So what would be the easiest way for someone who hasn't got uh, any polarity equipment or isn't experienced enough yet to, to or hasn't done any workshops with one of you people, uh, what, what would be a good way to start to treat scars? Just superficial needling and moxa? Oh, Oren, if I may introduce uh, yeah, Grace, go ahead. I, I think that a tiger warmer is a, a really great and easy way to start treatment of scars that is, is a pretty low risk way. Um, tiger warmer or lion warmer, I, th I think um, Philip talked about using that. Um, Basically, and these are MOXA devices, uh, which are used by a lot of people in the Kiko school, which is a, a piece of incense kept within a metal container, and the metal container becomes like a a warm pressing tool to work on the, the edges or to work on the soft tissue. Is that a good summary? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you can you can take a tiger warmer or similar um, and I think you you know you could use indirect moxa uh, or OQ as well but a, a tiger warmer, patients usually really like the feel of it and so, so it's um, if they're nervous about having their scar treated it's uh, it's usually a great kind of way to get them used to it and you know just do it until you feel some good circulation in there, feel some softening, usually you'll see the area get pink 
Um, and, and that's a great kind of beginning treatment for scars. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to share a, a story from uh, Mr. Yanagishita Sensei, uh, uh, one of our teachers in Japan who passed away a couple of years ago. Um, and he gave us a long lecture one day uh, on how to build a practice. Uh, and we thought that we were going to get a kind of lecture on, well, you should advertise here and you should put things <laughs> in the yellow pages. And that's the kind of lecture we thought we were going to get. And he kind of went through those options. He said, well, if you go to the newspapers and you know, get coverage, you might get a little boost in your patient numbers for a few weeks. And if you advertise in the yellow pages, you might get one or two calls every month. But the best way to build your practice is to practice your needle technique. In fact, what he said specifically was to work on your oshide, your left hand. Um, he said, if you do that, you'll start to get better results. And if you get better results, then your patients will go and sing your praises. And that's the best way to build a practice. And uh, it was a very kind of spiritual way of thinking how to build your business. But I think we can... Uh, draw from that that having the facility to treat scars is also a way to really build your practice because if you have first of all the ability to recognize that scars need treating and that they have secondary effects and secondly you've developed the skill set in which to uh, to treat those things then your patients will go and sing your praises because they might come for knee pain but if you treat the cesarean scar and it was purple and horrible and a few weeks later it's gone, or just flat and flush and pale, they will really sing your praises. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is yeah, there well, any... That's, uh, that's true. That I yes, that's very, very true. I think to be recognized by your patients and get them to uh, sing your praises, you have to be passionate about uh, getting great results. So I was there with you when uh, Yanagishta Sensei provided us with that great lecture, and it certainly holds true you know, for them to uh, tell others, and it does work. I'd like to ask a few more questions. Um, uh, going back to equipment, are, are there any particular kinds of needles that we should be using? Virginia, I think you have something to say well, about I think I think good quality needles is a must in any kind of acupuncture and the less pain that we can produce uh, upon insertion, the better off for our patients and our practices because the patients don't know if you memorize the classics in Chinese or Japanese. They just know this person hurts and that person doesn't. And uh, there was uh, some research presented at the Society for Acupuncture Research Conference. I think it was uh, 2003, perhaps, or 2004. Uh, at Harvard uh, about um, using functional MRI imaging of the brain what happened when the person had the da chi sensation when there was a painful insertion versus uh, just I think they just needled stomach 36 in both cases uh, doing it without any pain and without manipulation and the people got more of an endorphin response and more of a healing response in the brain when there was no pain associated with it. So I think, you know, having very fine gauge needles and you might want something like serum with a uh, silicone coating because that's a lot less painful. Also, there's something uh, that's on the Acupuncture and Medicine Journal website. Uh, it's aim.bmj. Um, dot, I think dot, dot com or dot co. Anyway, they have um, a 2014 article about the differences in needles under a microscope, magnified under a microscope, and uh, some of it's pretty shocking. <laughs> um, but also at that research, uh, Society for Acupuncture Research Conference years ago at Harvard, there was a poster presentation by a university in Korea about needle coatings. And they said that the expensive Japanese needles with the silicone coating, they wouldn't mention names, um, just a half of a percent of the needles have the coating come off under the, when viewed under the microscope. 
whereas the inexpensive Chinese and Korean needles, up to 88% of them had the coating come off. Mm. And uh, now there's uh, on this acupuncture and medicine website uh, an audio recording of uh, from Mike Cummings about uh, this findings about you know the quality of needles and with some of them there's shards that are coming off of the needle and staying in the body not that this is probably a common occurrence but with cheap needles this is you know quite possible so another reason and for scars you know getting back to that it's really important not to you know give them any extra inflammation or irritation in the area or any other uh, extra risk for infection as well. So, so what you're saying is to use fine, uh, thin uh, Japanese high quality needles for the treatment of scars rather than some of the thicker or uh, inferior quality needles. Um, right. Is there any uh, research, Grace, or is it, if someone wanted to read about treating scars, are there any books or are there any uh, papers that we could read about the acupuncture treatment of scars? Sure. Well, the, there's a pretty good chapter in Kiko Matsumoto's Clinical Strategies, Volume 1, um, which uh, you can, if you don't have it, you can get by way of uh, her website, kikomatsumoto.com. Um, and also in, in the November 1995 issue of NAJOM, the North American Journal of Oriental Medicine, uh, November 1995. That was that was her scar her uh, article on treatment of scars uh, that was first published in in a Japanese journal. And I think that uh, Philip, you've had an article uh, in Najam since then. Was it I, you? It was I. Uh, it was November <laughs> uh, 2012, was it? Uh, I can't remember exactly, but. Uh, that was when I first published uh, an article. Yes. Yeah, and, and now, and John, you can get you can get back you issues. Know, your in article on your article on uh, treatment of scars in Najon is based is your techniques using attention. Is that correct? It is correct. I've also published uh, uh, recently uh, in the Swiss magazine and the Irish magazine. Uh, that kept the Irish one came out last late last year. Also, I'm asked to present uh, in the Rothenburg TCN Congress next year. So, two workshops already uh, organised for that. Okay, everyone. Can I say We're something about needling? Paul, you go ahead. Yeah. Well, just a couple of points about needling if we're going to needle scars that are relevant for people who, as you say, haven't attended a workshop but are there and, and you know, can use needles in, in their clinic. Uh, a couple of principles which are really, I think, basic to follow. Uh, if you're not going to be doing the typical bridging of the scar where you're needling towards the scar at each end, then work with following the scar, and the, which is uh, in the meridian flow. Uh, if the scar is radiating a uh, sensation on palpation, you should needle in the direction of the of the radia radiation. Uh, also, when you do needle, you should stop where you feel the resistance and wait uh, two or three minutes until that resistance lessens before you you try to deep deep needle any deeper. But ultimately, uh, as uh, everyone has said, you want to stay quite quite shallow and. Uh, and probably lastly, yes, using a, a, a very low angle. Don't needle perpendicular because most mm -hmm. people who have trained outside of TCM will needle everything perpendicular. Uh, they don't understand that oblique needling method. So needling uh, in an oblique method, probably 10 degree angle, if not even less. But uh, and, and again, as everyone has said, the, mo the more shallow the needle, the better. Uh, I, I think that that would uh, help anyone who hasn't done a workshop. Thanks very much. Well, everyone, we're coming to the end of the show. Um, I'd like to chat just before we finish a little bit about Sayoshi TV and Sayoshi.com, which is uh, uh, and what we hope to do. So basically, uh, 
we are going to aim to help practitioners and students of Japanese acupuncture to raise their profiles and to brand and build their practices and increase their knowledge and skills. Uh, with so many styles of Japanese acupuncture being practiced outside Japan, Sayoshi.com is going to be a forum and a hub for all styles and all schools to grow and flourish. And we hope to help the public to learn more about the uses and benefits of Japanese acupuncture and palpation-based acupuncture. And we hope to help them find practitioners who are guided and influenced by this ethos. So, yeah, I'd like to thank you all very much for appearing on our very first Sayoshi TV show. It's been great. And uh, thank you very much all for coming. And thank you all for watching. Thank you, Oren. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Oren. A job well done. Thanks. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye -bye.